From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Everyone, welcome to this special Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, here in our Palo Alto studios. During this time of the pandemic, we're doing a lot of remote interviews, supporting a lot of events. The Cube Virtual as is our new brand because there's no events to go to, but we certainly want to talk to the best people and get the most important stories. And today I have a great segment with a world-class entrepreneur, Ajit Singh, co-founder and executive chairman of ThoughtSpot. Um, and they got an event coming up, which is going to be coming up in December 9th and 10th. But this interview is really about um, what it takes to be a world-class leader and what it takes to see the future and be a visionary, but then execute an opportunity. Because this is the time that we're in right now is there's a lot of change, um, data, technology, a sea change is happening and it's upon us. And leadership around technology and how to capture opportunities is really what we need right now. And so Ajit, I want to thank you for coming on uh, to the CUBE conversation. Thanks for having me, John. Pleasure to be here. So for the folks watching, you're the startup that you've been doing for many, many years now, ThoughtSpot, you're the co-founder, executive chairman, but you also were involved in Nutanix as the co-founder of that company as well. Um, you, you know a little bit about unicorns and creating value and doing things early, but you're a visionary and you're a technologist and a leader. Uh, I want to go in and explore that because now more than ever, the role of data, the role of the truth is super important. And as the co-founder, your company is well positioned to do that. I mean, your tagline today on the website says insight at the speed of thought. But going back to the beginning, probably wasn't the tagline. It was probably maybe like, we got to leverage data. Take us through the vision initially when you founded the company uh, in 2012. What was the thinking? What was on your mind? And how to take us through the journey. Yeah, so uh, as an entrepreneur, I, uh, I think visionary is a very big term. I don't know if I qualify for that or not, but uh, uh, what I'm really passionate about is identifying very large markets with very, very big problems. Uh, and then uh, going to the whiteboard and from scratch building a solution that is uh, perfectly designed for, for the big problem that the market might be facing from scratch. And just an absolute honest way of approaching the problem and finding the best possible solution. So when we were starting ThoughtSpot, the, the market um, that uh, we uh, identified uh, was uh, analytics, analytics software. And the big problem that we saw was that while on one hand, companies were building very big data lakes, data warehouses, there was a lot of money being spent in capturing and storing data, how that data was consumed by the end users the non-technical people, the sales, marketing, HR people, the doctors, the nurses, that process was not changing. That process was still stuck um, in, in um, old times where you have to ask an analyst to go and build a dashboard for you. And at the same time, we saw that in the consumer space, when uh, anyone had a question, they wanted to learn about something, they would just go to Google and ask, that question. So we said, why can't analytics be as easy as Google? If I have a question, why do I have to wait for three weeks for some data experts to bring some insights to me? For most simple questions, if I'm doing some very deep analysis, trying to come up with fraud algorithms, it's understood, you know, you need data experts. But if I'm just trying to understand how my business is doing, how my customers are doing, I shouldn't have to wait. And so that's how we identified the market and the problem and then we built a solution that is designed for that non-technical user with a very uh, design thinking uh, UX first approach uh, to make it super easy for anyone to ask that question. So that, that was the genesis of the company. You know, I just love the thinking because you're, you're solving a problem with a clean sheet of piece of paper. You're looking at what can be done. And it's interesting you bring up Google because you know, you think about Google's motto was find what you're looking for. And, and they had little you know, gimmicky buttons like, I'm feeling lucky, which just took you to a random web page at that mm -hmm. time. While everyone else was trying to build these walled gardens and this structural apparatus, Google wanted you in and out with your, with your results fast. And that mindset just never came over to the enterprise and uh, with all that legacy structure and all the baggage associated with it. So um, I totally love the vision, but I got to ask you, how did you get to Beachhead? How did you get that first success milestone 
Um, when did you see results in your thinking? Yeah, so um, uh, I mean, I, all, I I believe that once you've identified a big market and a big problem, it comes down to the people. So I sort of went on a, a, recruit, a recruiting mission and I um, recruited perhaps the best uh, uh, technology and uh, business team that you can find uh, in any enterprise segment, not only just analytics. Uh, some of the uh, early engineers, uh, my co-founder, uh, he was at Google before that, Amit, Amit Prakash, before that he was at uh, Microsoft working on Bing. So it took a lot of very deliberate uh, effort to find the right kind of people who have a builder's mentality and are also deep experts in areas like search, large scale distributed systems, um, very passionate about user experience. And then you start building the product. You know, it took us almost, I would say, um, two and a half, three years to get uh, the initial working version of the product. And we were lucky enough to engage with some of the largest companies in the world, uh, such as Walmart, who were very interested in our solution um, because they were facing these kinds of problems. And uh, uh, we uh, almost uh, co-developed uh, this technology with our early customers, uh, focusing on ease of use, scale, security, governance, all of that. Because uh, it's one thing to have a concept um, where you want to make access to data as easy as Google, you have a search interface, people can type and get an answer. But when you're talking about enterprise data and enterprise needs, yeah. uh, they are nowhere uh, similar to what you have in consumer space. Consumer space is free for all. All the information is there, you can crawl it and then you can access it. In enterprise, you for you to take this idea of search, but make it production grade, make it real and not just a concept car, you need to invest a lot in building deep technology and then enabling security and, and scalability and all of that. So it took us almost, uh, I would say, uh, two and a half, three years to get to the initial version uh, of the product. Um, and uh, the problem we are solving and, and, and the area of technology search that we uh, are um, uh, working on, we brought it to the market, it's almost an infinite game. You know, you can keep making things easier and easier. And we have seen how Google has continued to evolve their search uh, over time and it is still evolving. Um, we just feel so lucky to be uh, in this market, uh, taking the direction that we have taken. Yeah, it's easy to talk a big game in this area because like you said, it's a hard technical problem because of the structural data, whether it's schema databases or whatever, legacy baggage. But to make it easy, hard, and I like what you guys go with this, find the right information and put it in the right place at the right time. It's a really hard problem. And the beautiful thing is you guys are building a category while there's spend in the market that needs the problem today. So category creation with an existing market that needs it. So I got to ask you if you, could, if you could do me a favor and define for the audience, what is search driven analytics? What does that mean from your standpoint? Yeah, what it means is for the end user, it looks like search, but under the hood is driving large scale analytics. I like to say that our, that our product looks like a search engine on the surface, but under the hood, it's a massive number crunching machine. Um, so uh, search and AI driven analytics, uh, there, is, there is two goals there. One, if the user has any user, and we are talking about non-technical users here, we're not talking about necessarily data experts, but if a user has a question, they, uh, they should be able to get an answer uh, instantly. They shouldn't have to wait. That is what we achieve with search. Uh, and with Spot IQ, our AI engine, we help surface uh, insights where people may not even know that those are the questions they should be asking because data has become so complex. Uh, people often don't even know what question they should be asking and we give them uh, a tool that's very easy to use, but it helps surface insights uh, to them. So there is both a pull model that we enable through search and a push model that we enable through Spot IQ. So I have to ask you, you guys are pioneering this segment, you're, you're in first. And sometimes when you're first, you have arrows in your back, as you know, I mean, it's not all the beginners survive. They, they get competition copies, but you guys have had a lead, you had success. What's different today as you have competition coming in trying to say, oh, we got search too. So wh what's different today with ThoughtSpot? How are you guys differentiated? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's always a sign of success. If you, what you are trying to do, uh, if others are saying we have it too, uh, you have done something that is valuable and that happens in all industries. I think the best example is, is Tesla. You know, they were the first to look at this very well-known problem. I mean, we don't, we haven't had 
a very uh, sort of uh, unique uh, uh, take on the existence of the problem itself. Everybody knows that there is a problem uh, with access to data, uh, but the technology that we have built is so deep that it's very, very hard to uh, really uh, copy it and make it work in real world. Uh, with Tesla in automotive industry in cars, there is obviously so many other companies that have launched uh, battery powered cars, electric cars, but uh, there is Tesla and there is all the other electric cars where, which are a bit of an afterthought because if you want to uh, build a, 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 an analytics product uh, where search is at the core, search cannot be added on the top. Search has to be the core and then you build around it. Um, and that requires you to build a fundamental architecture from the ground up. And you can't take an existing BI product that is built for dashboarding and add a, add a search bar. I've always said that adding a search bar uh, in, in a UI is perhaps you know, 10 to 20 lines of JavaScript code. <laughs> Anyone can add it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there is so much open source stuff out there that you can just take it and plug it. Uh, and, and many people have tried to do that, but taking off the shelf search technology that is built for unstructured data and, and sticking it on to uh, a product that is, uh, that is required to do analytics on enterprise data, that doesn't work. We built a search technology that understands enterprise data at a very deep level, so that when our customers take our product and, and, and bring it into their environment, uh, they don't have to fundamentally change how they manage their data. Our goal is to add value to their existing enterprise data, cloud data warehouses, and, and deliver this amazing search experience where our search engine is able to understand what's in their data lake, what's in their cloud data warehouse, what are the schemas, the tables, the joins, the cardinality, the data type, the security requirements, all of these things yeah. have to be understood by the technology for you to deliver the experience. So now, now that said, we uh, pride ourselves in, in not resting on our laurels. You know, we have this sort of motto in the company, we say we are only 2% done. So we are on our own sort of uh, continuous journey of innovation. And uh, we have been working on taking our uh, search technology to the next level. And there is something really powerful that we are going to unveil at our upcoming conference uh, beyond in December. Uh, and that is going to create even more distance between us and, and the competition. It, and it's all driven by what we have seen with our customers, how they are using our product, our learnings, what they like, what they don't like, where we see gaps, uh, and uh, where we see opportunity to uh, make it even easier to, uh, to uh, deliver value to our customers and to our users. I think that's really profound insight you just shared because if you look at what you just said around thinking about search as an embedded architectural foundational, you know, embedded in the, in the architecture, that's different than bolting on a feature where you said Java code or some library, open source library. You know, we see in the security market, people bolted on security, had huge problems. Now all you hear is, oh, you got to bake security in from the beginning. You actually have baked search into everything from the beginning. And it's not just a utility, it's a mindset and it's also technology, metadata, data about data, software, you know, all kinds of tech is involved. Uh, am I getting that right? I mean, because I think this is what I heard you say. It's like, you got to have no, it baked this in. Totally, this is totally right. I mean, if I can use an analogy, there is Google search and obviously Yahoo also tried to bring their own search, Yahoo search. Yahoo actually, Yahoo versus Google is a perfect example or a perfect analogy to compare uh, with ThoughtSpot versus other BI product. Yahoo was built for predefined content consumption. You know, you had a homepage, somebody defined it. Uh, you could make some customizations and there is, but there is predefined content, you can consume it. Now they also did add search, but that didn't really go so far. Uh, while Google said, we will build from scratch ability to crawl all the data, ability to index all the data, and then build this serving infrastructure that delivers this amazing performance and interactivity and relevance for the user. Relevance is where Google really shines. And uh, you can't do those things until you think about the architecture from the ground up. Well, Ajit, I'm looking forward to having more deep dive conversations on that one topic, but for the folks who might not be old enough like me to remember Google back at that time, Yahoo was the best search engine on them. It was a directory basically with a keyword search. It was trivial, technically speaking, but they got big. Uh, and then the portal wars came out. Oh, we got to have a portal. Google was very much not looked down as an innovator, but they had great technical uh, chops and they just stayed the course. They, they had a mission to provide the best search engine to help users find what they're looking for. And they never wavered. 
And it was not fashionable about that time, to your point. And then Yahoo was number one, then Google just became Google and the rest is history. So I think, I really think that's super notable because companies face the same problem. What looks like fashionable tech today might not be the right one. I think that's... I, think, no, I totally agree. And I think a lot of time, there is a lot of, in our space, there's a lot of sort of hype around AI and machine learning. Uh, we as a company have uh, tried to uh, stay close to our customers and users and, and build things that will work for them. And a lot of stuff that we are doing, it has never been done before. So it's not to say that along the way, we don't have our own failures. We do have failures and we learn from them. Yeah. Yeah, just don't uh, make the same mistake twice. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. if you have a, a process of yeah. learning quickly, improving quickly, those are the companies that will have a competitive advantage. Uh, in today's world, nobody gets it right the first time. If you're trying to do something fundamentally different, if you're yeah. copying somebody else, then you're too late already. I totally agree. Uh, Great. If you do something new, it's about how fast you can iterate. And, and uh, that's, 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 that's a great that's mindset. Different. That's a great mindset. And I think that's worth capturing and calling out. But I got to ask you because what's, first of all, distinguish history and you just, I love your mindset and just solving problems, big problems, all great. I want to ask you something about the industry and where you guys were in 2012, right when you started the company. You were literally in what I call the before cloud phase because it was before cloud companies and then during cloud companies and then after cloud. And you know, Amazon clearly took advantage of that for a lot of startups. So right in around 2012 through 2016, I'd call that the Amazon is growing up years. How did the cloud impact your thinking around the product and how you guys were executing? Because you were right on that wave. You were probably in the sweet spot of your development. Yeah, yeah. Pre-business planning, you were in the pre-business planning mode. In comes Amazon, I'm sure you're probably using Amazon. <laughs> like, because you, as a startup, all of a sudden I was used Amazon at first. Yeah. But I just think about, do we have on premise, do we have a data center? How did that impact you guys and how does that change today? Certainly, yeah. So it's been a, it's been a, it's been fascinating to see how the world has evolved and how uh, enterprises uh, have also uh, really evolved in their thinking on how they leverage the cloud infrastructure. Now, uh, in the cloud, there is uh, the, the compute and storage infrastructure, and then you have uh, cloud uh, data warehouses, the analytics uh, stack um, in the cloud that's becoming more popular now with. Uh, companies like uh, Google um, having BigQuery and then Snowflake having really amazing success and things like that. So um, when we started, we uh, looked at where our customers are, where is their data and, and what kind of infrastructure is available uh, to us. Uh, at the time, there wasn't enough uh, compute um, to drive a search engine that we wanted to build. Uh, there were also not um, uh, any significant cloud data warehouses at the time. Uh, but uh, our engineering team, our co-founders, they came from companies like uh, Google, where uh, building a cloud-based architecture, an elastic architecture, um, a service-oriented architecture is in their DNA. So we architected the product uh, to run on uh, infrastructure that is very elastic, uh, that's, uh, uh, that can be run uh, practically anywhere. Uh, but uh, our initial uh, customers, enterprise, the Global 2000, they were they had their data more on-prem. So uh, we had uh, uh, started more with on-prem as a go-to-market strategy. And then uh, about uh, four, four and a half years ago, uh, once uh, cloud uh, infrastructure, I'm talking about compute infrastructure, started to become, become more mature, we certified our software uh, to run on all three clouds. So, um, uh, today we have more than uh, 75 to 80% uh, of our customers already running our software uh, in the cloud. Uh, and uh, as now, because we connect to our primary data sources, our cloud data warehouses, cloud data lakes, uh, um, uh, now with Snowflake and BigQuery and, and Synapse and Redshift, uh, we have enough of our customers uh, who have uh, deployed uh, cloud data warehouses. So we are, uh, also able to directly integrate with them. Uh, and that's why we launched our own hosted SaaS offering uh, about a month ago. So I would say our journey in this area has been uh, sort of similar to companies like uh, Splunk or Elastic, uh, which started with a software model, uh, initially deployed more on-prem, but then uh, evolved with the customers uh, to the cloud. So uh, we have a lot of focus and momentum and a lot of our customers as they're moving their data, data uh, 
uh, to the cloud, they are asking us as well to be in the cloud and provide a hosted offering. And that is what we have built um, for the last one year. And we launched it uh, a month ago. It's nice to be on the right side of history. I got to say when you're on the wave uh, to be there and that also makes integrations easy too. I love the cloud play. Um, let's get to the final segment here. I want to get your thoughts um, on your customers, um, your advice. There's a huge untapped opportunity for companies when it comes to data. A lot of them are realizing that the pandemic is highlighting a lot of areas where they have to go faster and then to go to cloud. They're going to go, they're going to build modern apps. More data is coming in than ever before. Where are these untapped opportunities for customers to take advantage of the data? And what's your, what's your opinion on where they should look and what they should do? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, I, I really think that uh, the pandemic uh, has um, uh, shown for the first time uh, the value of data for, to society at large. There is probably uh, more than a billion people in the world that have seen a chart for the first time in their life. Everybody has been, you know, when, when, when COVID hit us in March, April, everybody was looking at charts of infection and, and so on and so forth. Um, what has happened? So there is there is a lot more uh, broad awareness of what data can do in improving our society at large. Uh, for the businesses, there is, of course, in the last six seven months, you heard it enough from a lot of leaders that uh, digital transformation is accelerating. Everybody is uh, realizing that um, the way to interact uh, in the world is becoming more and more digital. Uh, expecting your customers to come to your branch to uh, do banking is is uh, not really an option. And uh, people are also seeing how all the SaaS companies and soft uh, SaaS businesses, business digital businesses, they have really taken off. So uh, if a company like Zoom can suddenly have a $100, $150 billion valuation because you are able to do everything remote, uh, uh, all the enterprises are looking to really touch their customers and partners in a lot more digital way than uh, they could do before. And definitely COVID has also really created this uh, almost, uh, um, you know, two buckets of uh, organizations. There is a lot of companies that have uh, tremendously benefited from it. And there is a lot of companies that have been poorly affected by it, really in a, in a difficult uh, uh, place. And I think both of them for the first category, they're looking at how do I maintain this revenue even after COVID? Because once this thing, you know, hopefully early next year, we have a vaccine and things can start to look better again uh, sometime next year. Uh, but we have learned so much. We have attracted so many new customers. How do we retain and grow them further? And that means I need to invest more and more in my technology. Now companies that are not doing well, they really want to figure out how to become more operationally efficient. And uh, they are uh, really under pressure to get more value from there. And both categories, improving your revenue, uh, retaining customers, you need to understand the customer behavior. You need to understand uh, which products they are buying at a fine grained level, not uh, with the law of averages, not by looking at a dashboard and saying, uh, our average customer likes this kind of a product. That model doesn't really work. You have to offer people personalized uh, services, and that personalization is just not possible at scale without really using data on the front lines. You can't have just managers sitting in their office looking at uh, dashboards and charts and saying, um, this, uh, these are the kinds of campaigns uh, I need to run because my average customer seems to like these kinds of offers. I need to really empower my salespeople, my individual, uh, frontline uh, workers who are interfacing with the customer to be able to make customized offers of services and products to them. And that is possible only with data. So um, we see uh, a really uh, a lot more focus in getting value from data, delivering value quickly um, and uh, digital transformation broadly, but definitely leveraging data in businesses there is tremendous acceleration that is happening. And you know, next five years, it's all going to be about being able to monetize uh, data on the front lines when you are interfacing with your customers and partners. Ajit, this great insight, and I really appreciate what you're saying. And you know, I wrote a blog post in 2007. I said, data will be the de new development kit. Back then, we used to call development kits software that used to develop. John, you are the real visionary. It took me until uh, 2012 to be uh, able to do this. Well, it, it wasn't clear, but you saw that data was going to have to be met programmed, be part of the programming, and I think. I think what you're getting at here is so profound because we're living 2020. 
People can see the value of data at the right time. It changes the conversations, it changes what's going on in the real time communications of our world with real time access to information, whether that's machine to machine or human, machine to human, having data in the right place changes the context. Yep. And that is a true, not a tech thing, that's just life, right? So I think, I think this year, I think we're all going to look back and say, this was the year that everyone realized that real time communications, real time society needs real time data. And I think it's going to be more important than ever. So it's a really big problem and important one. And thank you for sharing that. Yeah, actually bring up a, a very good point, programming, developing with data, uh, data as a development kit. We are also uh, uh, going to announce a new product uh, at Beyond, which will be um, about bringing ThoughtSpot everywhere, where a lot of uh, business users are uh, in their business applications. And uh, by using ThoughtSpot product, using our full experience, they can obviously do enterprise-wide analytics and look at all the data. Uh, but if they're looking for insights and nuggets and they want to ask questions yeah. in their business workflows, we are also uh, launching uh, a product capability that will allow uh, software developers to inject data in their uh, business applications and enable and empower their own business users to be able to uh, ask any questions that they might have without having to go to yet another uh, BI product. It's data as code. I mean, you can almost have, you almost think about like software metaphors. Where's the compiler? Where's the source code? Where's the data code? You start to get into this new mindset of thinking about data as code, because you got to have data about the data. Is it clean data, is it dirty data? Is it real time, is it useful? There's a lot of intelligence that's needed to manage this. This is like a pretty big deal. And it's fairly new in the sense in the science side. Yeah, machine learning has been around for a while and you know, there's, there's, there's tracks for that, but thinking of this way as an operating system mindset, it, it's not just being a data geek. You know what I'm saying? So I think, I think you're on the right track, Ajit. I really appreciate, appreciate your thoughts here. Thank you. Okay, you, this is a CUBE conversation, unpacking the data, the data is the future. We're living in a real time world and real time data can change the outcomes of all kinds of contexts. And with truth, you need data. And Ajit Singh, co-founder, executive chairman of ThoughtSpot shares his thoughts here on the CUBE. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. <laughs>